Okay, welcome everybody to our webinar today. I'm, I'm Asha Easton from Immerse UK. Um, we're going to be speaking today about raising venture capital for startups and scale-ups. I'm joined here today uh, by some great panelists. Thank you guys for joining us. We have Sean Beanie from the ICAW, who is also the head of our Access to Funding and Finance Working Group at Immerse UK. Um, Fabio LaFranca from Station 12. Puneet Raj Bhatia from London Co-Investment Fund and Catherine Gilroy from Cedars. So just to start off with, um, I'm just going to have you all go one by one and just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what kind of investing you do and what scale and stage of deals uh, you work on. So we'll start with, with Sean. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, uh, so my name is Sean Beanie. Uh, I work for the Institute of Chartered Accountants in its corporate finance faculty, and we cover all sorts of things to do with M&A and private equity and venture capital and capital markets. Um, and my particular area of expertise is around innovation, investment, uh, early stage investment, startups, venture capital, those kind of things. Hence, um, I'm a big supporter of Immerse UK, and uh, I, for Asher and her colleagues, I chair the Access to Finance uh, Working Group, which uh, all the people here today are involved in too. And uh, the aim of that is to do whatever we can to boost investment, uh, particularly in the UK's exciting immersive technologies, but also uh, in, in ventures that have international applications too. Great. Fabio, do you wanna go next? Hi everyone. So I work for Station 12. I'm an investment director there. We um, we invest early stage in uh, in startups in the in the sectors of sports, entertainment, and knowledge. Um, we are uh, SES, SES investors, and I'm also um, a member, a dream member of the European Innovation Council, um, the European Commission Innovation Program, giving grants of up to 2.5 million um, across Europe and until December for UK-based startup. Nice. Catherine? Great, yes, hi. So, uh, yeah, so my name's Catherine. I'm an associate at Cedars. We are an online platform that allows all types of investors to invest as much or as little as they like in startups and, and high growth companies. So allowing those businesses to raise capital, but also build out a community. Um, my role is to source early stage businesses for the Cedars uh, investor audience and to work with those entrepreneurs from the very start of their fundraising journey. Um, but as a platform, we facilitate investment from seed right the way through to series B. Um, we are pan-European, we're not sector specific, um, and in 2019 we funded uh, 250 deals which actually made us the UK's most active private investor. Nice. Puneet? Hi all, um, I'm Puneet Raj Bhatia. I manage uh, the London Co-Investment Fund. Um, it um, is a 25 million pound fund that was investing in seed stage businesses in London. Um, completely sector agnostic, uh, so long as they are digital science and technology based businesses, um, immersive uh, businesses form uh, a small but very important portion of our portfolio. Uh, the fund was fully invested as of last year in 150 businesses um, across um, a number of sectors, usually at the very early stage, but of course over the last five years the businesses have grown and some of them um, uh, beyond uh, the series B rounds. Um, so it's a quite wide spectrum of businesses and um, sectors within the whole area. Great. Um, Asha, you're on mute. <laughs> Oh, I muted myself. I'm sorry. About that. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to uh, drop your questions in the Q and A, and um, uh, we'll get to them at the end. But I'm gonna start with my questions, and uh, guys, please feel free to just like jump in. I'm not gonna call you by name to to answer. Um, the first question is: What types of startups and early stage companies are still raising money right now, and what opportunities are VCs looking for? Yeah, you asked me to set the scene there briefly, Asha, just with a few comments about the general picture before we we, we ask our three expert investors here. Um, I, I mean, I'll start with some good news, um, some slightly more difficult news, and end with some good news. I think that seemed like a good pattern. I, I mean, I think the first thing is that <clears throat> happily everyone 
recognizes and there's a political consensus in in most countries that um, startups and early stage companies are absolutely vital for economies for business um, and and for societies and um, they're, they're crucial to innovation so uh, that's why we support immerse uk and um, and and this sort of push to boost investment um, but running startups is nearly always very difficult it's a, it's a tough job even in in uh, easier times than this and obviously the crisis has has, has put even more pressure on businesses uh, in terms of survival in terms of retaining customers generating revenues managing cash um, many businesses have had to find ways of refocusing and many have also accessed the emergency funding uh, whether that's the emergency uh, loans and the future fund and uh, furloughing available in the UK or emergency funding from elsewhere. Um, what we're seeing, what we've seen in terms of deal trends is that there was already a softening of investment in seed and uh, sort of quite early stage rounds um, even before the crisis and signs that valuations had, had certainly softened, softened and that perhaps there'd been a shift to a focus on, on bigger rounds. In, in the UK, uh, investment is still dominated uh, by London and the Southeast. Um, some analysis uh, I've done of Bohurst data found that in the first quarter of this year investment in the UK actually held up uh, very very well in comparison with previous years. It was a sort of run rate of about 1.3 billion pounds in um, sort of startups and very early, early, uh, early rounds. Um, in the second quarter, which is where obviously lockdowns really applied in the UK, we, it, it, we've seen something like £1.2 billion pounds of investment. So that is that is a marked drop on previous years, which were running at about £1.3 or £1.4 billion, pounds, um, but not as sharp as we might have expected. But what's telling is that the number of deals has fallen very, very sharply in this second quarter compared with the second quarter of previous years. It looks like it's about 800 such deals uh, compared with 1,400 in, in the past two years. And I think one of the things that is going to put early stage deals under even more pressure in Europe, and I include the UK in that, um, is that one of the big pull throughs for VC investing in Europe in particular is, is the amount of M&A activity. And we know that that has, that has fallen. At the same time, we, we're also hearing anecdotally that angel investment is quite tight. So that's the, that's the tricky bit. I think the, the, the positive news, which I hope will, will be backed up by uh, the fellow panelists, is that there's still uh, the, as much as you know, $10 billion or more of uninvested venture capital out there there's still a huge amount of interest in exciting sectors, uh, obviously anything that's sort of med tech, uh, healthcare technology, healthier, healthier aging, uh, lots of things around renewable energy and clean tech are going to continue to be important and, and transport and energy use, uh, mobile communications and connectivity still huge and fintech very important and all of those are sectors in which immersive technologies are at play. There's, there also are there's a lot of R&D investments still going on in deep technologies like AI, quantum, uh, robotics, 3D chips, uh, blockchain, the, these kind of things. And I'm, I'm optimistic as well, um, at least in the medium term, about things like educational technology and um, the application of technology to creative to the creative industries, which I have a passion for and in which immersive technologies are, are, are very important. And I think we're also gonna see some interesting things happening in terms of neighborhood and community businesses and ventures, because that's where we're, we're all each sitting at the moment in different parts of the world. So I think the medium term outlook is that there is a lot of venture capital, there's a lot of prospective investment, but we know that it's, it's, it's very hard in, at this stage of the crisis for many businesses. Thanks, Sean. Do we, anyone else want to jump in on some thoughts on what types of startups and are raising right now? Um, I, I can give uh, uh, some examples from our portfolio. Um, you know, virtually every business in our portfolio is looking to raise money. That's 150 businesses. 
um, but the ones that are getting particular traction are in some of the fields that Sean has just mentioned. Um, uh, digital health being one of the one of the primary examples where uh, there's a huge amount of uh, interest and, and you know we are seeing competitive offers coming in. Um, remote working related businesses of of any sort that that facilitate that those are getting a lot of traction uh, some of the businesses that were that have, that have spent I don't know, three four years trying to get traction with some of the larger corporates all of a sudden find that they are overnight they are getting converted into a deal so so the, you know that's good positive news um but i think there is a lot of bad news as well along side this where uh, you're not expecting to come back anytime soon um, direct to consumer doing uh, reasonably all right depending on the sector food doing very well um, uh, business services again you know depending on which specific service we are referring to either getting a lot of traction or sort of stalled until businesses feel more confident to, to you know uh, look at new innovative uh, projects yeah that's really interesting we've seen a lot of investment in uh, or i've seen in, in vr platforms for example um that are trying to work on um you know remote collaboration um opportunities we saw like a massive investment 30 million into the wave um for example which is a platform that's being used for um, online concerts. So it's definitely a, a big trend. Catherine, Fabio, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think I would um, echo some of some of what's already been said. So, um, I mean, we are always looking for uh, kind of innovative companies that, that are looking to raise um, money. And so that hasn't changed during lockdown. Um, we did shift our focus slightly towards businesses that we thought that would maybe benefit from taking, you know, from from doing a smaller bridging round rather than a you know a full growth round at this stage, um, or perhaps towards those businesses that don't necessarily rely on physical human interaction. Um, so. As, as the other guys have said, you know, med tech businesses, uh, online e-commerce, education technology. Um, and then for the past month or so, we have also been working really hard with our community of entrepreneurs who are looking to raise money through the government's future fund. So that has been a focus for us as well. Well, uh, I think the, um, the positive, positive bit was um, some VCs and not, not especially, but some VCs have not really uh, stopped or interrupted their invest and investment process in the sense that if they were talking to a business uh, just before before the hiatus, the, the great pause, um, they carried on and um, and and didn't really consider or um, impacted valuation. Of, 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 of the business that was initially discussed. So I, I think that was a positive. I think that was a great uh, understanding and, and then there was an encouragement um, going forwards. I can't deny that, that you know, VCs like ourselves will be pivoting along with the startups. Um, to be more specific, in, in our sectors like uh, live events, uh, concerts, live music, sports, um, we, we, we are uh, more and more looking at uh, immersive propositions, immersive concerts. Um, sports is a bit of a funny one because we, we were looking at, I mean, I was looking at VR for sports and I was hoping um, fans would, would join stadiums um, with, with the headsets. And in fact, what happened is clubs put fake balls and fake fans into the stadiums. So that wasn't what the transfer I was hoping for, but um, it could still take up. Um, there's a sense that there's more stuff going virtual, but not necessarily, di um, most of it going digital, but not necessarily virtual or immersive. Um, gaming, obviously, is, is, is a big one, and any conception of content um, uh, on, on platforms. Uh, people are definitely behind their screens way more. Uh, so there will be, there'll be a shift there, and, uh, and, and new habits will be born. Um, we we also engage in, in M and A activity, and uh, we we we're working on a couple of mandates, and there's definitely an appetite there, uh, just because valuations will be more depressed and the pound is a bit weaker. So foreign foreign investors, especially yes, um, or, or corporates, will be looking at the UK market with a with a bigger appetite. Nice. 
Um, so I want to now ask you guys about, uh, well, I'm, and I want to bring up an opportunity that's come up from the government where we talk about like um, how companies been using um, kind of government um, money. So the Sustainable Innovation Fund just, just launched. So that's um, 191 million pound fund to help um, the UK economy recover. Um, and it's going to come out in, in two different rounds, but we've seen lots of these, um, you know, different emergency business funding measures come out uh, with furloughing, CB, ILS, bounce back loans, the future fund, et cetera. Um, how, have, how have VC backed companies been using these methods, these helping hands? Any thoughts? I can give it a start uh, from um, our portfolio. Um, Virtually all of the businesses have uh, used uh, the furlough scheme in some way, shape, or form, um, uh, ranging from following, you know, sort of one or two employees to, in some cases, large parts of their teams, uh, because there is no uh, ability for them to form. Um, the um, the C bills has been used by about thirty percent of our portfolio. Um, I think uh, there is a lot of there has been there have been issues with the um, qualification criteria, uh, specifically you know sort of businesses uh, in difficulty, um, and the definitions around that, which has made uh, a lot of the VC backed businesses that are not profitable not um, uh, qualifying for for that. Um, the future fund has had similar sort of traction, um, but we have to um, recognize that a very large portion of our portfolio is angel bag and uh, the specific structures around the future fund requiring non-EIS compliant instruments makes it very difficult for some of these businesses to raise match funding. Um, so um, that's again been a little bit of um, difficulty. Um, um, and I think I think that's where things are, and, and everybody is, um, you know, talking to uh, you know, for you know for the, for the grant funding anyway. Um, a lot of the businesses in the portfolio already have those. They, some of them have been expedited, uh, and and that's been very fortunate. That's great. Um, yeah, I just pick up on, on, on some of that. So I, I agree with a lot of what was just said there. So lots of the business that we are working with have taken advantage of the job retention scheme, which I think has been a real lifeline for a lot of businesses. Um, in terms of you know, the loan schemes, we, we're working with uh, high growth, um, but loss making businesses a lot of the time. And, and so those schemes were not necessarily available. Um, and so I think there was an acknowledgement that there needed to be something else. And, and, and so this is where the Future Fund came in. Um, at Cedars, we, we are big supporters of the Future Fund. And as I mentioned, we've been working really hard with our entrepreneurs who are looking to take advantage of it. Um, we've been acting as lead investor. Um, and, and so far, we have either submitted or been involved in 13 applications. Um, none of them have been rejected. Nine have all been approved so far, including some of our you know, existing Cedars alumni. Um, which we think is a really positive sign. Um, there obviously was a lot of commentary when the scheme was first announced about whether there would be any uptake on it, given that it's not EIS compatible. Um, but I think if you look at the fact that on day one of the applications um, of, of the scheme being opened, there were 450 million pounds worth of applications went in for a pot that was at that stage was 250 million. So um, I, I think that does show that there is certainly appetite for the scheme. And, and as I say, we're certainly seeing that on the platform. For us being yes, uh, yes, 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 investors, the, the future fund was quite problematic. I, I mean, I, I did like the, the reaction from the government and from the BBB. I, I, thought, I thought it was very good. That was really sending the really, the really strong signal. I think in the execution, um, the fact that, you know, the yes was a bit of a problem and the rush to apply and the fact that some companies from some VCs um, were a, a bit more ready and uh, and have ra have raised the match funding or can raise the match funding. Uh, that I think the execution was a little bit problematic for us or for some of our of our profit companies. We are still looking into it, uh, of course. Um, but I think it's a testimony of how strong the ecosystem is. And um, 
and how innovation is taken seriously. And, I've, and that's a great, great positive. I've, I've, it was great as a VC and as a supporter of the ecosystem of startups to see, to see that kind of reaction. Yeah. I've actually really, uh, I, I, I did like the, the shift that Innovate UK took um, in, in putting out a, a funding opportunity that was 100% funding, because as we know, most this is the first time that's ever happened. Calls are usually only funded up to maximum 70% of total project costs. And for that call, um, for the COVID response, which you could get up to 50K in total of total project costs um, fully funded, um, there was like 8,600 applications, um, which is I think more applications than they get for all calls in an entire year, uh, which was um, you know a, a good sign and I think got out to at least 100, um, sorry, 800 companies got funded through that scheme. Um, and hopefully you'll be seeing more of these kind of calls coming out. Um, but just, you know, all of you have mentioned the EIS scheme. So um, if I could get one of you maybe to just explain that for anyone on the call who doesn't, who doesn't know what that is. Can I, can I just uh, suggest that there's a, there's a subsidiary question that to, to that, Asha, that someone's asked online in the Q&A board here, which, is, oh, yeah. which, which people might be able to help with, which is just um, for our expert investors here, um, what, what we're defining as seed, because uh, so, someone has asked saying that they're developing an app, but it's still in development. So what sort of funding would be applied to that? Um, for example, the future fund wouldn't really apply to uh, out and out startups, because in order to qualify for the future fund, you've got to have already raised uh, at least a quarter of a million pounds. So that was one of the misgivings we had about the future fund. But uh, I, it might might be useful just for the panelists to say, well, what, sorry, where do you what do you view as seed and an early stage, and um, wh where where you look to invest? Because uh, I, I imagine that may be a, a question that quite a few of the people who've tuned in have. Can I have um, can I have a quick go? Uh, seed uh, can can depend on on the on the country, can depend on the VC, on the size of the fund of the VC. Obviously, uh, a seed round in the US uh, will be a bigger size than a seed round in the UK or, or potentially in Italy, for example. Um, the characteristics of the seed round is probably the most important. Uh, mostly, the businesses have a team in place. There is an MVP. There is potentially a pilot already tested, um, a pipeline. It can be pre-revenue. It can be pre-profit, uh, but with, with, with a strong sign of uh, product market fit. And the series A, you put in the pro product market fit, uh, you have some revenue already, revenues already, and then you're on your way for, for some scaling. But to see this is, is that stage just after you had um, some an angel, look of a couple of angels putting some money, saying, I trust you're the right guys to, 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 get, this ID, to, to get this ID going. And the seed is um, starting to formalize, putting an advisory board together and, and, and having the, the foundation for for the takeoff. I, I think I can add a little bit to that. Uh, for our purposes, we define uh, sort of seed as rounds of below 1.5 million. Uh, now, the profile of the business obviously plays into that as well, as, as Fabio just said, uh, but we wouldn't consider rounds of, you know, sort of over 1.5 million as seed rounds for our purposes. There's an interesting follow-up question here asking, how would a VC go about appraising a seed opportunity, particularly if pre-revenue? Does anyone want to jump on that one? <laughs> how would you appraise a seed opportunity if it's pre-revenue? Um, I think from our side, we would be looking for um, we'd be looking for traction of of, of some form. And um, so we'd be looking at the size of the community. We'd be looking at how many you know uh, users or customers there are, how how sticky that that user or customer base is. Um, we'd be looking at the strength of the team. Um, so there's lots of different things that we 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 take into account. Um, we do raise for um, you know a fair few pre-revenue businesses. Um, they just, uh, yeah, they have to be able to demonstrate some form of traction, whether it's through a pilot or the form of testing, um, to, to be able to, to, to justify what they're, what they're doing to our investor base. Who need any thoughts? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's it, all, all of the criteria that uh, somebody would uh, use to do their due diligence would apply to a pre-revenue business as well. I suppose where 
the due diligence might be a little bit light is on the financial criteria because you know obviously there isn't that much um, uh, financial due diligence to, to conduct in in those circumstances uh, but all of the other things in terms of um, the uh, the specific product or service the market traction the um, uh, the team the uh, the the, la the market size or you know how big the opportunity is the go to market uh, models uh, all of those things uh, are are the ones that uh, the investors would consider okay great um and so what what would you say um from what you're seeing um, and trends what opportunities for startups and early stage companies uh, might arise as we come out of the covid crisis and especially opportunities for immersive businesses I'll have a go then. Um, I think for, for us, um, it, it's it's very much about um, content and experiences within sports, media, entertainment, and education. Um, so any any proposition that allows the consumption of a content or, or experience will be uh, is is the is the immediate opportunity. Um, we can think of um, concerts, virtual concerts. We can think of um, tools and platform to either uh, create, uh, distribute and monetize uh, content or experiences. Yeah, we've seen some, I've seen some interesting moves in the um, spatial design like uh, space, people creating tools to, you know, um, make the 3D design process easier so you can actually create 3D assets in virtual reality as opposed to doing it on a 2D platform. Um, and tools like Tavori, for example, that are making the animation pipeline easier. Um, and, and seeing those kind of evolving, that's been, a, I feel like, a trend I've seen. In the last Absolutely, year. and also because live action uh, production, films, films um, production was, was literally stopped. Uh, engines uh, from Epic, like Unreal Engine, is definitely an opportunity. So any ecosystem created around Unreal and Epic Games um, is interesting for us, whether it's uh, in-game advertising or tools or, or education. Uh, these are these are the opportunities for the next two years we'll be looking at. We have got some questions here, Asha, from um, people. I think there are quite a few questions from people who maybe are still developing technology and developing their business ideas. And um, I think just to help with that, I, I think that any 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 time that e even in good even in good times, better time easier slightly easier times than these. I think if you're still developing a technology and a business idea, you um, you're probably you're either looking if it's if it's if it's a hard if it's a hard technology, it, you're either looking um, precisely for support from the likes of Innovate UK, um, or in some cases uh, those business angels who are prepared to take uh, the considerable risk of investing in pre-revenue businesses, uh, or or if, if, if you're lucky uh, and, and strive to getting on a, a, an effective uh, accelerator program. And that tends to be the case um, until you're starting, to, you, you've sort of proven the business model and you're commercializing it, which is when, when VC tends to come in, I think it would be fair to say. Um, so, because we're getting a lot of questions around that. So I hope that's helpful and, uh, and, and, and clarifies that a little bit. And related to that as well, we have this very, very generous uh, incentive for investment in the UK called Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, or SEIS, which, is, um, which effectively gives a, a very generous tax break to anyone who invests in, in, a, in an early stage business, a seed business, um, um, giving them a tax break of up to 50% initially uh, against their tax bill if they're, if they're prepared to take the risk. And businesses can raise up to £150,000 under SEED EIS. So I hope that helps uh, with those questions we're having from people who are still at a much earlier stage of developing their business ideas. Um, and you, were, But you did mention earlier that you've seen angel investment has tightened up. Um, how would someone go? But there are, there are existing networks like angel networks that focus primarily on, on this SEIS investment. Um, Type of scheme that I've 
scene? Do you, I mean, how do people even get their foot in the door? How do they get started about buying um, investors? Well, I'll, I'll say sometimes, sometimes luck, sometimes having very good contacts. Uh, but there are also people like the UK Business Angels Association, UK BAA, um, does have a sort of directory of, of angel networks, and they can they can be a useful way to get to, to sort of test out the market if there's if there's an appetite from angels for uh, for what for what you're doing. Um, it often it, it is very dependent on uh, not not only what kind of business you're developing and the technology behind it, but also uh, in, in some cases where, where you are in, a in, in, the, in the UK, for example. Um, so there is a degree of serendipity to angel investing. Um, but certainly, as, as you said earlier, Asha, everyone should look at the programs uh, that, that Innovate UK is running and, which, and on which you advise at the KTM as well. If there is a technological heart, if there is an innovation or IP heart to their, their concept, yeah, that's great. We have another question that came in here that asks, like, would a VC invest in a product or development project, not in the company itself? Would you do that? I see shaking heads. <laughs> Unless it was spun out into its own, maybe, company. It's not, uh, yeah, no, it's not really. We invest, we, we invest in the team, effectively. The team um, comes before the product. Uh, the product can and, and pivot and change and evolve, but, but the team is the most important, and 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 the company is structured, you know, to to uh, is the firm is the best framework for for investing the team, really. Yeah, I've heard that from lots of investors that you know they invest in in a team that they know can pivot if the you know product doesn't work. That's right. one of the most important things. Penny, any thoughts on that? Would you invest in a product only? Um, in rare cases, I would say, um, if the product proposition is substantial enough and it's backed by uh, a technology um, that you know we can see can be picked up by professional managers, uh, then we could consider that. But it it happens rarely. Usually, you know, the team is important. We need to see um, who is leading the team. So we, we can accept gaps. Uh, for example, you know, if, if, if there isn't um, a, a revenue officer or marketing officer in the team, then that's fine initially. But a core set of founders usually are important at very early stages. Okay. I think I'll add to that. Sorry. No, go for it. Go for it, Fabian. Okay, um, I think I'd like to that. Uh, maybe the sense of that question, the, the question behind this is, if a company has been um, operating and selling a product or a service and they wanted to pivot and wanted the funding to develop that new product, um, we, we've had that in the past where there's been an agency, for example, in media, and then they, they, they see an opportunity in VR and they want to develop the product, but they don't have um, the, internal, the internal cash. Um, it can happen, and then we would be, you know, investing in a product line. But um, the question we, I mean, the question we have is, what is the transition from the team? Because at some point, the team would have to shift from a service line or a product to another, and there would be there could be a mission drift, there could be some distraction. Um, so that's one of the one of another reason why uh, we struggle to invest is just a product or a new product line. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would agree with a lot of what's already been said, particularly with the businesses that, that I'm working with, which are early stage businesses. Um, investors, a lot of the time, are they're backing the founder and they're backing the kind of backing them and trusting them that they will they will hustle and they and they will grow the business. Um, so so that is is very important, and and the team is very important. Um, so so I think we're we're probably pretty aligned on that. And that's where in, innovate innovate UK's role is so important. Um, it's uh, it's got many different programs and uh, competitions underway um, and, and hopefully more in the pipeline and that's precisely to help people who've developed something new begin to take the journey to, to taking to begin that journey to taking making it into a, a real business into commercializing it is the the language with, that we use so <clears throat> innovate uk grants and loans can be utilized when you're still at a point where you have, you're developing a new technology, 
but you're not really ready to take it to, to market yet. It's, it's not, not proven in terms perhaps of, 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 of customers and the, and the market yet. Um, and, and that's where they come in to help you build, build a business around that technology as do quite a lot of um, the, the effective accelerator programs. And once you've started to build that business, just as the uh, other panelists have said, that's where it becomes uh, uh, appropriate for, for venture capital money of the, of the types that, that, that they're providing here. We have a pretty specific question here, um, but it can, it can apply, I think, to, to other companies. I think you kind of covered that actually, Sean, as well, but um, it's a nutraceuticals company with no EIS or SEAS, um, but they moved last year from being distributors to developing their own IP. Um, the early stages, but it, they said it looks like there's great conversion to clients um, to their own tests and products. Now they may choose to raise one million or to accelerate R and D and getting they're getting into new markets. Want an interested investor? Any thoughts on who they should talk to? It's pretty niche, but. <laughs> Is, is, is the KTN, uh, Asher, the right place to start? If you're, if, you're, if you're still at that point of development and you're looking at what the options are, it, it, that's part of the role, I would say, of the KTN, whom you work, isn't it? And, connect, and, and, the, and, and the, the knowledge transfer network helping those yeah. people to connect with different forms of funding. Yeah, we, we actually have an access to funding and finance team within the KTN um, that networks with um, VC funds and angel networks um, all over the UK and, and internationally. So um, if you bring them the, the product and uh, the business plan, they'll let you, they'll, they'll first judge, you know, if it's at the right stage and then, um, you know, can point you, point you in the right direction for that. But I, again, with R and D, though, I really, really uh, do encourage people to to hunt through the calls that, that are coming up from Innovate, and especially because there are so many um, kind of open ended calls that are coming out to the, around COVID support. Like the the, the variation in, in 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 applications that came in uh, for, on that last call that was 100% funded for COVID support was was massive. So there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, so what, what would all of your top tips be then for companies looking to raise VC funding now? What would be your, your biggest tips to funders? What are the mistakes to not make? I would say um, don't ignore the elephant in the room. So be prepared to answer questions from investors about COVID-19. Be prepared to defend your valuation. Be prepared to have your business plan scrutinized for COVID defensibility. Um, if you've seen a surge in demand during this period, be prepared to justify your figures and your forecasts and whether you can sustain those numbers moving forward. Um, but, but yeah, so be prepared to acknowledge it head on, I think. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll uh, I corroborate that and I'll, I'll add on to that. Um, it's not good enough for investors usually for somebody to just be defending their business plan uh, in, in the current environment. You know, the, the investors are looking for growth. Uh, so the business plan, the proposition needs to be um, taking advantage of what the current situation has to offer. So it needs to be more relevant um, than it would have been otherwise because of the new realities that, that all of us face. So I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that and it's important to showcase the proposition as being ever more relevant in the new world. I, um, I mean, of course, every VC will ask about COVID-19 impact and then as, an in, as, as, a, as a founder, I will have already almost two plans. One, pre-COVID, uh, one post-COVID. So delay your numbers by three months or six and, uh, and knock out 20% of your top line uh, sales. Um, but a, a fundamentally good business for us um, could actually, would actually take advantage of the COVID. Um, some businesses out there exploded with, in growth with uh, COVID-19. Uh, of course, Disney Plus is, you know, is, is, is not a startup, but uh, the consumption of content, gaming, um, new ways, new tools, new apps, uh, there has been a big revealer uh, during this period. And um, if anybody thought that Quibi was, was a good business model, well, we all now know that you know, it, it's not enough to be a content business, to be a, to be, um, to be a, 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 good, a good business model. Quibi didn't work out. So we, uh, in a way, COVID-19 was, uh, you know, uh, can, can be the, the, um, 
a blessing in disguise in some startups in the sense that, you know, if, if business wasn't working for COVID, then, you know, what, did you have a fighting chance in a world that is increasingly digital and virtual? Um, I think what's important also is because your numbers change and because you will have to pivot, you need a good story. And the VC always like, likes a good story. So when you explain the story arc, if you're going from profit making to loss making, what is the reason? If it's just COVID, the, you, you might go under more scrutiny. Um, if it's, if it's a, a fundamental flow in your business model or in your, in your product or in your, in the, you know, consumer target, then that's your chance to actually, you know, build on the story or change it or, or, or make it more compelling. Mm. Um, there's a big opportunity there. Yeah, we're seeing like a collective forced, uh, you know, digital transformation of the entire world. Anyone who wasn't uh, on board is being forced to do it now. Um, so I think that's really interesting uh, what you've been saying, Fabio, about, you know, seeing a trend in, in development of platforms and, you know, um, on the content side of things, like I've also seen like a trend away from, uh, you know, people creating bespoke pieces of content and instead creating platforms that enable people to create their own content. For example, it's one, one thing. Um, I've also, I'm, I'm just on a personal level curious about if you've seen any trends around um, security uh, pieces like that are people are building either for immersive um, in the immersive space or just generally because as everyone is being forced online we're also seeing a massive you know uptick in cyber crime and things like that so we're all becoming more digital but it's a pro it's that raises a lot of other issues have you seen a trend in startups or anything that come up solutions for this these issues either in immersive or otherwise Any? Kind of specific but i'm just curious not for station 12 because obviously that that's not um our, tar our target sectors but through the i have to say through horizon 2020 the um the, the innovation program and, and grant program from the european commission i have seen uh, more cyber security startups that's that's actually interesting you mention it and um some are interesting and some are quite like literally uh, scary if you're if you're a bit of a conspiracy yeah. theorist uh, like myself, <laughs> my <hand. laughs> uh, there is, I've seen some quite some scary stuff and uh, there's definitely a new uh, continent, you know, as they say there. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I'm really interested in like the, the future of the, you know, forging the open metaverse and all the building blocks that need to fall into place in order for that to happen. And like seeing people do things around like self-sovereign identity, um, I think is is really interesting and in how people are going to own their own data and capitalize on it. Um, how are we going to own our our data, not just on like what we, like you know Facebook and things like that, but like the data of our avatars, for example, in the future, like what what's that going to look like? Um, and then we're also seeing things like you know in-world business uh, changing, like in Fortnite, for example, like I don't. Maybe it hasn't happened, but like a Louis Vuitton or something could create a skin for an avatar and that becomes a whole new kind of like marketplace for the fashion industry. And, um, you know, I think that's re that's like a really interesting trend we're seeing. Um, and I, I don't think it's going anywhere. So it'd be interesting to see how um, investors, you know, start to start. To for sure. Up. For sure. Especially in sports where players have image rights and those image rights now extend to what we call digital humans. Mm -hmm. and digital personas of, of um, athletes and even um, any kind of artists, singers, actors. I mean, that's, that's also a new, a, new, um, a new revenue generation. And there, is definitely, uh, uh, there are definitely opportunities there from monetization to creation mm -hmm. and all the legals, you know, uh, legal implications. Yeah. Um, we have a long question here, so I'm going to, we have two minutes left, so I'm going to try and read it out really quick. Um, but they say they have a potential client who's developed and soft launched their online product. Um, they've generated revenue. They're concerned that raising finance in the current market to scale the business will be difficult given most of the funds raised will be spent on customer acquisition. They are giving away a base version of the software free to build the database of users. They would then charge for customization and more advanced versions. Did the panel have a view on whether this approach would still allow them to attract capital and how proof of that revenue generated from this approach um, would they need to have before approaching the market? It's a long one. <laughs> Any mm -hmm. thoughts on this like version? It, it's, it's very hard to uh, 
comment without knowing the specifics of you know exactly what the uh, what the product is but gen generally speaking i think you know it, it, the the freemium models for uh, software adoptions are not new they have been around they have been the right approach to get early traction um before um you know uh, before the monetization can 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 happen and vcs have looked at that in the past i i would think they will ca carry on looking at uh, you know these kind of uh, go to market models as well uh, but you know obviously it depends on specifically what the software or the service is and, and how much traction is available that sounds like get in touch with Pune to but, um, find out but it does it does it does um it does i mean it does raise an interesting question i'm always really intrigued in asking vcs uh, so i butt in here because there's also a question on the q a board about business plans and how much they change or need to be changed and adapt as time goes on i wondered if i could ask the three of you on both those subjects in general, how much weight do you give when you're when you're looking at a business plan to variously the the, the team who's behind this and what they what they've done before, the core technology, and then the, and then the, the potential market for something? I mean, do you do you tend to start with one of those, <clears throat> um, or do you tend to focus on one of those right through the process? Um, or does it just depend on which which, which sector? I mean, I'm quite intrigued on that because your 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 investment styles are all different, so the answers might be different too. Yeah, for us, it's it's a combination of all of it. So it's it's really being able to take um, take all of those things you just mentioned and 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 figure out how we can. Um, put it in front of our investors in in a way that's going to make it as attractive as possible. Um, for for equity crowdfunding um the traction is important but also the business having some form of community whether that is um you know customers and users whether it's beta testers if they're at a very early stage whether it's a very well developed um, you know personal and professional network of the founding team and um, they're the things that, that we are really looking at particularly when businesses are at, are at an earlier stage um but you know I, I don't think you can take you can take one without the other in terms of you know the business plan the actual technology or the team it, it has to be a combination of all of it um to, to make it an attractive proposition. Taking back to the top, I mean, the, the business, the startup has to answer a problem in the market. Now the solution can, can have different nuances or it can be entirely different over time. But if there's a fundamental uh, problem or gap in the market and there's a conviction that, you know, the founders can fill that gap, of course we'll be receptive if the audience is the same or if, if a targeted group of beta testers are the same and they, they give feedback and then the, pro the, the product is, is, is its rating. I think that's a, that's a great sign of agility and intelligence actually. Um, but is there a fundamental problem uh, to answer? And then are we 100% are we focused on answering that problem? Mm. Um. Just another question, something I, I, I find with uh, two, two problems with uh, first time founders um, and the kind of mistakes, I guess, in, in the fundraising process, one being not doing the due diligence on the investors that they're going to. So just kind of like blanket talking to investors, but not trying to find out what their goals are first um, is one issue. Um, and the other being, you know, starting to, to look for investors when they need the money as opposed to starting well in advance. Like how far in advance should be companies be creating the relationships with, with their invest with investors? Should they have their like fully formed business plan ready before they come and talk to you? Or like how 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 long should they be like, you know, growing that relationship before they come and ask for money? Um, as early as possible, I, I'd say uh, we know the, from our co-investors that uh, sometimes they track businesses over a very long period of time. Um, some businesses would have, um, you know, for a Series A investor, some businesses would have approached them at the seed stage to just make them aware of what proposition they are bringing to market and keep them updated as the products uh, or or the you know, sort of commercial milestones are met. A and that creates a good um, sort of um, 
warm relationship that you can bank on when you are ready for that size of funding uh, from that sort of investor. So it, I, th there isn't, uh, um, but the earlier you have, you build those relationships, the better it is um, and, and more fruitful it is at the appropriate time. Yeah, we, we operate in, in, in a slightly different way, given given the nature of the platform. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the, the process on the platform, you want to be coming to us uh, at least three months before you actually need the cash in the bank, just because of the, the time that it takes to, to run a campaign on the platform. Um, but having said that, most of the businesses who are um, coming to speaking to us are already in conversations with their lead investors, whether that's an angel or whether it's an institutional investor, before they before they come to us. And so, um, yeah, it really depends on your network. It depends on which investors you're approaching. But I would agree that as, as early as possible is 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 always um, is always good advice. To to make sure that you are building those those proper relationships and to make sure that you are connecting with the right investors for your business as well. What's the ideal amount of time to run a Cedars campaign? You said three months just there, so I'm just curious. Yeah, so that's kind of from, from start to finish. Um, so preparation, then the actual campaign, and then closing. Um, businesses will be, um, they'll have a, a short private phase of, of, of the campaign where they will give people in their own networks and their customer base and their user base early access, and then they'll be up live on the platform and open to our investors for up to 40 days. Nice. I'll just back up your point, Asher, about um research actually I, I would say this because i'm i'm a lifelong researcher really researcher and writer but the i, I i've rarely seen i've rarely seen a, a, an early stage business or, or even worked for one in a couple of cases that that couldn't do could couldn't benefit from more research you can't do too much research into uh, the, the 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 technology the products or service you're providing whether there's a real market for it who the customers are and I doubt VCs would complain that you've done too much research. But, but like you, Asher, I'm a big fan of also encouraging people to do their research in terms of what are the right kinds of finance, which is why people have tuned in today, and uh, who are the right kinds of providers of that finance who, you, who, who you'll need to get on with. Um, and on that subject, um, a quick plug for something that's absolutely free and huge is the business finance guide which is freely available online uh, which is supported by lots of people including my institute who who, who devised it uh, with the british business bank and innovate uk and if if people are just starting on that uh, to ask those questions about funding then, then start, start with the business finance guide where we set out very clearly with lots of examples and videos and case studies online what the types of finance are and what you'll need to consider if you're if you're going to begin that process of approaching investors. So you could find uh, drop a link for that in the, the chat, Sean, if you can find I it. Have. Oh, you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. It's really helpful. Does anyone have any final questions? I'm, I'm aware of uh, of time, so I don't want to go over. Um, I guess I'll just leave all of you then to kind of wrap up with a final a final comment um and then we'll leave it at that fabio do you want to start um final comments well thank you for for having me it's always great to be to be close to, to the community and, and 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 hear what's happening from, from people's perspective um i think my my advice, and that's something we do ourselves, is uh, use this time to do as much uh, biz dev as possible. Uh, that's your chance to to get on on a Zoom uh, or Teams and talk to as many people as you can. Uh, it is okay now to to pitch virtually. It is okay to to nudge people. Um, we actually have more time <laughs> during the day because we don't have to commute, and you know, um, but but. Take advantage of that. Do a lot of business development and start building those relationships. Because if the fundraising market is a bit difficult until the end of the year, maybe, then at least you will have preempted, you'll have prepared those relationships. And then when the market takes up again, you will have done all the homework and, and the legwork. I'm going to let everyone give their final comments, but it like, raises one last question for me, which is that, you know, a lot of, as you said earlier, Sean, like when I asked, how do you find investors? A lot of a lot of it can be serendipitous. It's going to live events. It's like running into people um, and networking. That's really important. And now all we have is Zoom. So, <laughs> if anyone has any final thoughts as well on 
you know, networking events where you can meet investors online. That's very rare. Um, I feel like, um, how do you make that serendipity happen online? <laughs> if anyone has any thoughts on there that. There are, there are, I would just say, I mean, there are a lot more things like this, like this that you've organized Asha going on now. Um, and you know, we have switched to online. We will be moving back to meeting each other as well. So please also do that. And, um, I, I would just say that one of the, I think it's very important. Obviously, these feel like very worrying, gloomy times, quite quite rightly. And uh, in this country, we we've, we've been through a few things over the past few years. Um, but but the, you know, but Britain is still a very vibrant, creative, uh, democratic culture, and so it it were it's still a great place to start a business. And um, there are lots of great investors uh, in, in the UK as well, or, or who invest in businesses in the UK. So I think although this is this is a, a hard time for, for businesses and, and employees for that matter, um, th this is a great place to do business. And we, we, have, we have that vibrant financing culture as well as a, a technologically creative one. So uh, we'll be doing more to help you with Immerse UK as well, Asha. Thank you, Sean. Pretty uh, oh, Catherine, go for it. I was just going to say, I would agree with that. I think history has shown us that, you know, market leaders can be born out of a recession and out of, out of a, a difficult economic period. And so I think whilst it's undoubtedly a difficult time for, for the, the startup ecosystem at the moment, I think we will see an awful lot of innovation coming out of this, out of this period. And um, particularly as people are, you know, basically forced to accept and embrace technology and, and new kinds of technology into their everyday lives. And so I, I think, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be um, quite an exciting space to, to watch and particularly the immersive tech um, field. I think over the next year or so, we're going to see lots of exciting things come through. I, I think, yeah, that, that totally echo that. Uh, I think, by nature, uh, as investors in the early stage ecosystem, we are all optimistic, and and we remain so that you know there will be new uh, business ideas, new technologies coming in, and this time will move on, um, and and you know there will be a new reality in which uh, there'll be many many more opportunities and and much more um, innovation and 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 growth possible for us, and when we continue to seek. Um, um, investment opportunities to capitalize on 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 those uh, on those trends that that we are seeing now. Well, the, you know, thank you so much. It, Sorry, go ahead, Fabio. It's a silly consolation. Remember when Brexit was depressing, and uh, just imagine what's coming after COVID nineteen. Um, just just stay positive and enjoy enjoy the moment. Uh, keep keep doing what you're doing because uh, twenty twenty is far from finished. Uh, I don't know what we'll have next, whether it's uh, UFOs or Godzilla's. But, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I hope think, not. Uh, <laughs> Numerous killer bees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so stay positive. And, uh, and in fact, the community has gone online, but we are a bit tighter now. I mean, you can talk to an investor for 10, 15 minutes, whereas before you had to make an appointment and spend an hour. So I think it's tighter in some other ways. Well, cool. I love to end on a high note. So that's great. <laughs> I love the positivity and the optimism. <laughs> it's really nice to hear. Uh, but I echo what was said in the chat here that um, it was incredibly helpful and inspiring. So I appreciate all of your time. Thank you for doing this. Um, as I mentioned, everyone, this was recorded. It'll be available on the Immerse UK website um, by the end of the day. And uh, yeah, so stay safe, guys. And thank you. Thank you very thank much. You all. Thank, thank you. you.